Now we're talking to Laura Flanders. She's the host of the Laura Flanders Show on public television across the country, radio stations, YouTube, and LauraFlanders.org. Laura is a well-known progressive journalist who's been in the fight for a long time and seen a lot of things. And and I want to talk to her about different models of systemic change as well as current events. So Laura, great to have you back on TYT. Oh, it's great to be with you, Jenk. Really a pleasure. Fabulous to see your work just grow and thrive after all these years. Thank you so much. And and Laura, by the way, is also a New York Times bestseller, author of several books you should check out. Um, so, uh, Laura, uh, let's start with the current cabinet situation. So, we've got a couple of morsels. Uh, some folks in the progressive community are relatively happy with Janet Yellen and Treasury. John Kerry is climate czar. Um, let me start super broad, good enough or, or uh, are you worried uh, in terms of what we see from the Biden cabinet so far? Absolutely not good enough and um, not particularly surprising either. I mean, anybody thought that the Joe Biden administration was gonna be a tremendous departure from what we've seen in the past would just have to have been kidding themselves from the beginning. So am I surprised? No. Uh, you know, that some of the innovations are worth mentioning. The idea of a cabinet czar is a great thing. But John Kerry in that position, 76 years old, we can do better. If you want to model, if you want to indicate that you are about something new and that you noticed who it was that got you into office, you wouldn't have put John Kerry in that position. Although I think it's a great thing that there's a cabinet position for a, a climate czar. Janet Yellen, you know, very lovely apparently and smart person. But somebody who's been a deficit hawk, concerned about spending, as is the history of Joe Biden. So does that make me feel like we've got a team that is about to really do what's going to be required to right the ship of this country in the next year? Absolutely not. And by the way, those are the best picks. <laughs> the rest are way more. Oh, I mean, you want to talk about the national security picks? It's like great. There's women at the top of Mossad too. But you know, does that give me cause to celebrate? Not exactly. I mean, I, I just think we've you know we've fallen into this trap so many times. And, and you and I have talked about this before, Jenk. This sort of um, personalities, people stories over the actual policies of these people. I wrote about it in that book, Bush Women, going back to the Bush administration. Condoleezza Rice was as much an oil man as Dick Cheney. She just didn't look like one on TV. And this national security cabinet, you know, does it look like America? Sure, but do we want a national security surveillance state that looks like America? I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> not well, what I voted for. That's right. And the national security head is a woman, but she's the woman who authorized the extrajudicial killings in the drone program under Obama. So that's not really what that's we're right. looking You've for. That's right. You've got a, a DNI a DNI head who who was in charge. You know, played a big role in the the, the drone wars. And you've got a CIA director who at least has one incident, I think, of waterboarding on her record. You know, this is maybe a great bit of a step of the right direction for gender equality, but it's not the step a step in any kind of new direction when it comes to the US role in the world, the world, the US respect for civil rights, human rights. It's not the direction we need to be going on in if we want to just plot any kind of a new course. So today on the Young Turks, we covered a, a, a shooting in, in Florida, unfortunately. Two young African American men killed in a police shooting. Uh, and um, and then we were talking about the chance of a criminal justice reform in this administration. Joe Biden very publicly in the debates and very emphatically uh, denied uh, having anything to do with defund the police. And in fact, in interviews before the election, he said he wanted to give more funding to the police. So um, what's your take on um, uh, not just the, the, the movement uh, is not an interesting conversation. The movement for criminal justice reform is an absolute necessity. No one who watches this show thinks otherwise. What's interesting is the conversation around the framing, right? So. Uh, some people thought it was very poor framing to call it defunding the police, and others thought it was a good long-term strategy. Where do you stand on that, Laura? 
Well, you know, as somebody who tries to cover the economic underpinnings of a lot of our problems in society, I wasn't sorry to see the word defund be popularized. Because look, we've defunded schools, we've defunded public housing, we've defunded public health care. Uh, suddenly, the discussion of defunding the police, I think at its best, made people think about what are we spending money on and what could we spend on differently. Uh, I don't think most of the people who were raising the call to defund the police were calling to sort of zero out social you know security budgets around the country what they were mostly saying was the what we are doing right now is not keeping everybody safe it is not keeping our communities safe broadly speaking and certain people are absolutely not being protected in fact they are finding themselves on the receiving end of deadly force from our so-called so, you know, security forces. So I think the discussion to go back to this question of funding is critical. And some of what people have done with that uh, slogan has been important. So in, in LA, for example, we recently had on the show uh, the folks who presented the people's budget to the city council. And these are longtime activists, Dr. Melina Abdullah and others, who did a survey across LA capturing the opinions of some 25,000 people. So that's more people than usually get involved in city council elections, period. And they're asking them what are their priorities for safety. And police funding or increasing police budgets was way down at the bottom of a list of 10 or 12 priorities. That kind of work um, goes way beyond the sloganeering. And I think where our media fail is that they'll debate the slogan and they'll bring on people to have a cat fight about it. But they won't really look at the work that is underpinning the slogan and from which the slogan kind of arises. So pull back the curtain on a lot of these shorthands and you've got long term organizing about shifting priorities at the level of local spending and going up to the federal government. That's where I think shows like mine and yours fill in a huge gap. But if we left it to just a debate about how our um, money media, what kind of a mess our money media can have of a slogan like defund the police, then of course you can have politicians bending over backwards to say they would never consider such a thing. Right, so then let's talk about some of the other things that you guys cover on your show, because I think it's really interesting. The, uh, for example, you mentioned models of systemic change. So can you give us an example of one uh, that people are working on that, that yeah, is not often I mean, in the media? You know, for, you know, for years people said, you know, another world is possible. And I think the mission that I've taken on on my show on public television is to show that another world is actually palpable. You know, it, it is out there. What we saw in the last election, I think were polls suggesting that people were in favor of universal health care. They were in favor of changing priorities at the level of budgets for policing. Some were even in favor of the discussion around abolition of incarceration as a solution to all our problems. They just didn't believe that a candidate like Bernie Sanders, for example, could win, that his proposals were viable. What we need to show, I think, uh, as reporters as well as as activists, is that in fact there are models of viable change happening around the country. So right now, we today I I was uh, doing a show about what's happening in Philadelphia, where you have long-term organizing around housing rights paying off in the housing authorities agreement to cede some 250 homes to local people to renovate, to rebuild, to keep out of the private market and keep in a public hands. The market, as you know, has not been a good determinant of housing values, except for investors. When it comes to actually housing people, it's not the sort of thing you can leave to just you know the highest bidder because then you see a city like Philly, one of the poorest on the East Coast, seeing all the new housing being at the very top end of the market for, for, for millionaires and above. What the people there did was during the COVID crisis say, look, a pandemic is no time to be homeless. More than ever, we need homes that are safe for our most vulnerable. So what did they do? They moved into some empty space, which happened to be the Philadelphia International Airport. Nobody was flying, there's a huge amount of lobby space there that's healthy, clean, well ventilated. They moved in, moms with kids. 
two other occupations, two other encampments sprung up over the summer and fueled in part by the Black Lives Matter movement as the protest movements grew around violence against the African American community and state violence from the police. You saw those encampments grow and stay and a community develop in the city that defended people against eviction when evictions were in order. I mean, were, were being ordered. So at the end of the day, you see a victory for people who were connected with long term nonprofits, organized across race. There's a role for unions in training some of the houseless people to renovate homes. You're shifting power into the hands of local people. And more than that, you're changing the debate about housing. So that we begin to say actually investing in public housing is an important thing for the society to do. It happens in other countries, in Vienna, one of the most popular cities in Europe. Half of the population live in what they call social housing, which is well maintained, well respected, not getaways in the way that it is here. We can shift our sense of what the society does. Um, does it just make the way clear for people to make huge profits of public land and the resources of a city? Or does it actually cater to the needs of local people? And in Philly this year anyway, not unlike what we saw in Oakland, we saw land move into a community land trust that um, will be operated by a variety of stakeholders working together in a nonprofit environment in the city. So yeah. I, it's that kind of thing. Like we can do this, um, but we can't do it and we can't educate people about their possibilities if we leave it just to the media that have really no investment in changing the yeah. status quo. Yeah, and look, we're out of time, but I, I'll, my quick two cents is that the difference between what you're describing in Europe and here is that. Here, uh, our politicians are allowed to take bribes in the form of campaign contributions. So every city is run by someone who took tremendous amount of money from real estate developers. So you have the same exact thing happen. When they put up housing, it's actually high end housing, LA, New York, Philly, etc. Because that's where uh, they got the bribes from. Uh, and so I call it what it is. The rest of the media says, no, those are honorable people who happen to give all the breaks to the high end real estate developers. And you happen to have homelessness all around you because, hey, look at that. They're also corporate media who's in favor of uh, corporate real estate developers. So that's how this country got screwed. In, in uh, Europe, in some portions of Europe, they do something radical where the, where the government actually represents the people. We should look into it. It's an interesting Shopping. model for systemic Socialist. change. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Laura Socialist. Flanders, host of the Laura Flanders Show. You got to check it out. Uh, such great, brilliant work there. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Thanks, Jen. It's a pleasure to be with you on the conversation. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. Really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.